if you want something, you have got to be relentless. You've got to learn how to become resourceful. You've got to learn how to become creative. When crises strike in your life, and in the Chinese language, crises mean danger, but it also means opportunity. And this is an opportunity for you to grow. And you've got to be so relentless, regardless of what comes down the pike, that you're always looking for a way to get over, always looking for a way that you can break through, always looking for a way that you can win, always looking for a way that you can strike a telling blow. And pretty soon, I think there's some people watching us in the universe to say, wait, let's call a meeting over here. You know that guy Mustafa, look at him down there. He won't stop. Just that fool don't know he can't get over. Look, 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 look here. Why don't we do this? Let him go and let's make, mess with somebody else. Just let him go on through. Life will just get tired of whipping you sometimes and just say, let's just let this one go. <laughs> I believe this. Now, no one has told me this, but I just kept on kicking. I didn't have sense enough to stop. I was intelligently ignorant. I didn't know what I couldn't do. So I just tried anything. And the fascinating thing about life, because you can't get out of it alive, you might as well have a good time, you know? <laughs> Live your life with passion, with some drive. I was giving a seminar the other day and I mentioned that I was gonna do some training in August with some young teenagers and take about a hundred away to a two or three day camp and wipe them out, been working on this. So after the speech, one of the parents walked up to me and said, Mr. Brown, I, I'd like for you to do something for my son. He's not motivated. I said, I wonder why. I wonder what's wrong with him. He had no fire whatsoever. <laughs> See, what, what you do speaks so loudly, folk can't hear what you're saying. And so if you don't have any fire, you know, you've got to watch the, the people, the relationships that you develop. Have people of, of, of kindred mindsets. If you're around folk who are dead and negative all the time, they will affect you. You want people that are around you that have smiles on their faces, looking good. I was telling a group last week, Abraham Lincoln refused to hire God because of his face. He said, but the guy can't help it. He said, anybody over 30 is responsible for their face. If you have some depressing face looking at you every day, it affects your blood pressure. Keep these dead faces away from you. It's contagious. This is serious. So you've got to watch your countenance, watch your face, have an uplifted expression, watch your body posture. All of these things affect you psychically. You've got to be the kind of person that you are fearless, fearless. Folk leave fearless people alone. There are some people walk through a neighborhood and every dog in the neighborhood would bark at them. But there are some people come through and ain't nobody gonna mess with this. <laughs> You are unstoppable. And because you are unstoppable, because you've got power that you haven't even begun to use yet, you owe it to yourself to release your brakes. How many of you have the experience of pulling out of your driveway and you're mashed on the accelerator and the car was just going, uh, and couldn't move, and you mashed harder and it couldn't move, and then you discovered you had your emergency brakes on. And then you release those emergency brakes and it goes, choo! Have you ever had that experience before? Most of us go through life with our brakes on, holding back, not giving all that we have, not sharing all of ourselves. Most of us go to our grave still holding on rather than releasing it. What are some of those things that, that keep us from releasing it? Because of past experiences, past defeats, past pain. We look back, well, it didn't work out then. It probably won't work out now. Many people get confused their performances with who they are. Here's the next one, philosophy to help change my life. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's what you do about what happens. All of us are in like a little sailboat, and it's not the blowing of the wind that determines your destination, it's the set of the sail. So jot this phrase down, it's one of the best to understand. Kids need to understand it. The same wind blows on us all. The wind of disaster, the wind of opportunity, the wind of change, the wind when it's upside down, the wind when it's favorable and unfavorable. The same wind blows on us all, the economic wind, the social wind, the political wind, the same wind blows on everybody. The difference in where you arrive in one year, three years, five years, the difference in arrival is not the blowing of the wind, but the set of the sail. And that's what learning is all about, to set a better sail this year than last year to set a better sail. The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. Second six years, I wound up rich. You say, well, the Democrats must have finally gotten power. No, no, no. 
It was not a political change. Here's what changed the second six years of my economic life. It was my philosophy that changed. The set of the sail of better thinking, correcting the errors of the past and picking up new disciplines for the future. That's all I had to do at the end of the first six. Correct the errors of the past and then pick up some new disciplines for the future. And my total life changed. The second six years was totally different than the first six of my working life. And guess who can do that? Anybody. Now you can keep on the same path for the next couple of years as you have the past two. But if you wish to, if you wish to, and maybe everything's okay for you and you don't need to, but if you need to make some changes, I'm telling you, you can start doing it today so that the next two years will be drastically different than the last two. And anybody who wishes to do that can. And you can do it between ages 40 and 43. You can do it between ages 13 and 50. You can do it between ages 60 and 62. Any two years, any five years that you wish to drastically change from the previous five, you can do it if you wish to. Now, this isn't written. This is not a law. Here's what it's called, opportunity. But if you don't know you can change, if you don't know you can drastically change your income, change your future, change your health, change your marriage, change everything. If you don't know that, some people then go year after year after year after year not making much change simply because they didn't get to the class. They never read the book. They never went to the seminar. They never made the discovery. They didn't seek for the knowledge of how could I make my life better. And if you just rock along, I'm telling you it's okay. Anybody can live any way they choose, but I'm here to tell all of you that if you wish to, it's possible to make the next three years totally different than the last three. And all you have to do is just a few things. So we got that one now. It's not the blowing of the wind that determines your income. It's not the blowing of the wind that determines your fortune. It's the set of the same. And that's why we gathered here today. Maybe I've got some ideas that'll help you with a couple of little things about setting the sail of your thinking that might drastically give you multiplied more benefit the next three years than you've gotten in the last three. So it's not what happens. What happens, happens to everybody. Chevron years ago brought me in to talk to management. They said, Mr. Owen, you travel around the world and you're fairly knowledgeable. What do you think the next 10 years are gonna be like? I said, gentlemen, I can tell you, I do know the right people. So they all leaned forward and listened carefully. And I said, gentlemen, the next 10 years are gonna be about like the last 10. The next season after fall is, well, I promise you that's not gonna change. After day comes night, I promise you that's not gonna change. Here's how the last 6,000 years reads. If you want to make a note of Jim Rohn's vision of history the last 6,000 years, here's how it reads. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. It's gonna read like that, looks like, for the next 6,000 years. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Now, sometimes there seems to be more opportunity than difficulty, and then sometimes there seems to be more difficulty than opportunity, but the mix isn't gonna change. After expansion comes recession, but after recession comes Expansion, not to think so, see, is naive. And once you've got just a little of this stuff settled, then you know exactly what to do. You know exactly what to anticipate so you can be ready. Now, here's the next one. Here's what it says. For things to change, you have to change. I was hoping the government would change and taxes would change and economics would change and my boss would change and be more generous. I wished for everything to change. And my teacher said, no, Mr. Owen, for things to change for you, you have to change. Don't. Wish it was easier, wish you were better. Once I understood this, this altered the course of my life. Don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. And here's the big one. Don't wish for less problems, wish for more skills. You don't need less problems, you simply need more skills. Don't wish for less challenge, wish for more wisdom. Accept the challenge, because you can't grow without a challenge. You can't get rich without a challenge. You can't fly without gravity. You have to understand the challenge. But that's the key, is to now develop wisdom to overcome the challenge. Don't wish for less challenge, but more wisdom. And then here's one more philosophy to help change my life forever. But it's a good thing to keep going all of your life to be curious about what's happening. Curious about human beings, curious about the setup, curious about human behavior. Be curious about yourself. But be curious about government, politics, society, banking, money, army, navy, taxes. You know, what makes things work, what makes a city work, what makes a government work. I remember years ago someone mentioned uh, Russia might conquer China. I said, if you conquer China, what the heck would you do with it? <laughs> trying to comprehend how the world works, you know, trying to comprehend how... When, well, I remember going to Manhattan for the first time. I was so awestruck. This huge city, and one thing came to my mind was, how does this city work? How does everything get in? How does everything get out? And how does everybody get fed? And 
when you have a salad, the lettuce is fresh. And I thought, how does this happen? You know, it's just, it's a, it's a miracle how the city works. It's a miracle how the country works. How does an economy work, right? So that it stays on a steady course. And, uh, it's amazing. But if you keep that kind of curiosity going, and then simply be curious about your relationship with other people, yourself sitting at the conference table, be curious about how you could get into the inner circle where they talk about incredible things that affect, you know, business, commerce, society, and the world. And I think that's probably number one's curiosity. I think probably what served Tony Robbins, who attended my seminars all those years ago, the attitude was an incredible, insatiable appetite for learning. And I think if you've got that, that's it. You know, that's part of curiosity. You just want to know. So reading the books was no problem. Going to the library was no problem. You know, going to class and taking notes was no problem. Then I think the third one was to immediately start putting some of it into action. Not to wait till you know it all, but to do what you know and let the rest be unfolded and revealed. The illustration is on a foggy night, if you can only see 100 feet, if you walk that 100 feet, now you can see another 100 feet. You know, take it a bit at a time. But for those components that really start some one on the road to success, I, I think that's it. Curiosity, appetite for learning, and willingness to put it all into activity right away. Then probably willingness to take constructive criticism, not put down the criticism. You know, it's okay. But here's another way to consider, if you just added this, I'm telling you, it'd make you twice as powerful. And somebody says, wow, I'll consider that. So there's unique ways to say it, and then there's, you know, the blundering ways to say it. But if you can get people to give them credit for what they're already doing, add a few more things, a bit of refinement, that's it. People willing to accept that kind of constructive analysis of how they're doing. Those are some good components. I asked two good questions I think that are really vital, especially for mature people. Number one, what's got you turned on? Question number two, what's got you turned off? Two excellent questions. Food for thought. Years ago, shortly after I met Earl Schof, I finally found out what had me turned off and I got that cured. And I got enough reasons to get turned on. And from that day until this, no one has ever said to me, when are you going to get going? When are you going to get off the couch? When are you going to get started? I've never heard that since I was 25 years old. Once the fires were lit for me, they've never gone out. I've gone through my challenges from rich to broke and back to rich, and I've been through it all. But I've never had someone say, you got to get up from here and you got to get going. Never. And I don't really know how to teach it, and I really don't know how to explain it. All I know is if it ever happens, it's one of the great experiences of a lifetime. Get enough reasons to turn you on, and then just keep adding some more so that you never lack for emotional or physical vitality and spiritual strength to just keep going, to make your life as good as you can, go as far as you can, earn as much as you can, share as much as you can, be as much as you can to the people you love and care about, live as well as you can. If you once develop that thirst and the zest, but it's interesting, what's got you turned off and what's got you turned on, see if you can't cut loose from the stuff that's got you turned off. Maybe it's negative attitude, maybe it's poor thinking. I was so ambitious. Once I met Mr. Shove, found some new ideas that were life-changing. Profits are better than wages. It helped me become wealthy. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. I'd never heard of that before. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. It's not something you pursue. Wow, those things really revolutionized my life. And I got so excited about now becoming successful. I knew then I was going to become wealthy and successful. But I think I was a bit overambitious. Some things I went for in the beginning cost me too much. If I'd have known what it was going to cost, I wouldn't have paid. But sometimes you just don't know till after. You think, oh, this is it, this is it. Sure enough, when you finally acquire it or reach that position, you look back and say, wow, I spent too much time, too much money. I let go some values that really are important to me that I forgot about or misjudged what it was going to cost. So I think we always have to look into the future and say, what do I want and what's that going to cost? There's two great words of antiquity everybody should learn. Here they are, one's positive and one's negative. And we studied a bit about that yesterday.
positive, negative. Here's the positive word from antiquity. Behold. That's the positive word. Behold the possibilities. Behold the opportunity. Behold the future and give it design. Behold and look at the chances you've got. Behold, spring has come. Behold, the day has arrived and the sun is shining and the shadows are fleeing away. Behold, the next person you can meet might be your friend for life. Behold, the next person might be a colleague forever. Behold, that's the positive word, behold. Now, here's the negative word, beware. Now I want to give you a sentence to jot down that's very valuable. Here's what it is. Beware of what you become in pursuit of what you want. Beware. All of our lives, we have to deal with behold and beware. When a kid goes to school, it's behold the opportunity and beware the danger. Behold and beware. So beware of what you become pursuing what you want. Some things I went for in the very beginning cost me too much. I got so obsessed with some things that I found out later the price was too big to pay. If I would have known better, I never would have paid. But sometimes we learn when? After. After. So don't become so obsessed with something that you lose your sense of reason or it costs you your friend. Don't be so obsessed with something that you compromise your virtues and your values. The story says Judas got the money. You say, well, that's a success story. No, no. It's true, 30 pieces of silver was a sizable sum of money, but it was not a success story. His name was Judas. Doesn't that ring a bell? It makes all the difference in the world. Judas got the money. Here's something interesting about the story of Judas. After he got the money, he was unhappy. Someone says, well, if you had a fortune in your hand, why would you be unhappy? And here's the key. He was not unhappy with the money. He was unhappy with himself. Here's a key phrase. The greatest source of unhappiness is self-unhappiness. It's not from outside the things that make us unhappy. The greatest devastating unhappiness is to be unhappy with yourself. Now, a mild form of unhappiness is construct. The desperate form of unhappiness is destruct. It's like worry. We should all worry a little, but not let it destroy our lives. If you're in New York about to step off the curb in downtown Manhattan and the yellow taxi's coming, best you worry enough to get your feet back up on the curb lest you get yourself wiped out. So it's called caution, but not undue caution. It's called fear and worry, but not the worry that kills you, not the worry that destroys you. It's like hate. You know, you don't need to hate your job. Save your hate for the important things like evil, like the weeds that attack your garden, like the diabolical ideas that try to entice your children. Right? You don't need to hate everything. I hate this, I hate that. That's the misuse of your hate. Save it for the things we really must hate. But this is so important now to beware. Judas was so unhappy, he tried to take the money back. They said, heck with you, we got what we wanted, you got what you wanted out. They threw him out with his money. Now he becomes so desperate, he goes out and hangs himself for what he did. He became a traitor. So that's the caution now. If Judas could speak back to us in any kind of clear language, here's what he might say. Beware of what you become in pursuit of what you want. Don't sell out. It's not worth it. The whole balance, I think, is important all of your life. For our kids, you know, so much learning and so much play and so much education and so much time off. You have to just not overload kids with too much time to learn. A little change of pace. Back when I went to school, we called it recess, right? You can't stay at it, you know, it's like hour after hour. You have to take a little break and take some time. But it's true as an entrepreneur. It's true in a sales career. It's true for a minister of a church. Whatever you're in is to find that balance of working hard so that the job gets done, but also taking the time. I used to work hard and think, wow, I should have my family on the beach. And then I'd take my family to the beach, and at the beach I'm saying, wow, I should be at the office. So you just have to learn to say, when you're at the office, do the office stuff. When you get to the beach, you know, forget the office for a while. And that balance is important. It's important in good health, right? They had this diet that said, high carbohydrate is the way to go, right? Sure enough, it wasn't. Now it's all finally turned around, and we know a lot more. And it's called high protein, low carbohydrate, and all the rest. The first self-interest is to survive. I do an interesting thing now on the instructions given to the first couple, Adam and Eve, after the garden experience. The instructions were, number one, multiply. You know, it's a lonely world with two people. But the second instruction was interesting, and I try to find ways to translate it when I lecture in other countries. And it says to be fruitful. Fruitful.
fruitful or productive. First, you need to produce enough to survive. If a man is by himself and he produces enough for himself, that's called self-care. Then, if he wants to live a higher life, a companion or get married, he now must produce enough for himself and his wife. Somebody says, well, why work that hard when you can just take care of yourself? That's okay. This is not a moral question. This is a question of do you wish to live a higher life, a better life? And almost everyone would agree that would be a better life to be with somebody. But now comes the challenge now to produce enough for two instead of for one. Now they decide to have children. Now the man must figure out a way to produce enough for himself and his family, his children. And the question always is, why do that? Why not just take care of himself? And said, this is self-care. First to survive, then to live a better life. He pays that extra price of producing more than he needs for himself so that he can live a better life. And the next challenge is, is that the end of it? And the answer is no. Why wouldn't the man think of ways now to produce more than he needs for himself and his family? And the question is, why work that hard? Why do that? And the answer is to be generous, which is an even higher life. Then I take it two more steps. Why not accept the challenge to produce much more than you need for yourself and for your family? Somebody says, well, that's ridiculous. Why do that? You don't understand. It's to live a higher life. Then I take it one step further to produce far more than you need. What a way to live. Extraordinary. It's okay to live an ordinary life and a pretty good life, but how about an extraordinary life? To produce far more than you need for yourself and your children. Suppose you make $10 million a year and you and your family only need $3 million. Some families are more expensive than others. Well, let's say $3 million would pretty well cover most every family. Now you've got $7 million to give, to share. How about that kind of life? It's called extraordinary to produce more and far more than you need for yourself. It's best to earn some of that early money in lifestyle. Go to the movies, take two vacations instead of one. Just some little extra things that now the family gets inspired by this new commitment to earning more and becoming more and making the studies and learning the skills and whatever you have to do. Now you make it more worthwhile for the family by thinking of lifestyle changes that now become very exciting. Go to the concert. My parents said, don't miss anything. Don't miss the play, the music, the songs, the performances, the movie, whatever's happening. At age 93, my father, before he died, if you would have called him at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, he wouldn't be home. He's at the rodeo, he's at church, he's at the play, the performance, he's watching the kids play softball at age 93. So he did it as well as taught it. Don't miss anything. So those changes in lifestyle. When I started making some extra money, I opened up an account for my wife, and I called it No Questions Asked Account. And I said, here is the checkbook for a new account, and it's called No Questions Asked. I'll just keep putting money in there, and you spend it for whatever you wish. It was life-changing. It wasn't a fortune, but she didn't have to ask anymore for money, because I could sense that it was a little embarrassing at times when she had to ask me for money. I thought, well, that's not good. So the first time I get a chance, here's what I'm going to do. And sure enough, I did it. No Questions Asked account. You can't believe what that did. It was absolutely amazing. Anything you can think of that helps to change lifestyle is called making a living, but also making a life. Lifestyle, social friendships, you know, church, community, country, all those things that make a composite of our overall life. Start furnishing that with new vigor, vitality, money, whatever it takes to expand your life into what I call the good life, as well as economics. It doesn't take a lot. How much is a movie, right? Even for a person of modest means, six dollars or something. It costs sixty million to make it and only costs six dollars to see it. Part of it's just simply priority. Less soft drinks, more movies. Everybody's got the money. The story I tell of the lady who invested the dollar, now she's a millionaire. So she had the dollar. Depends on where you put it. A four-hour lunch, how much can you eat? Just a few people, but at the end of four hours, you know, you're richer than when you sat down in terms of exchanging ideas, confidences, experiences, plans for the future, accomplishments. It's exciting. Probably nothing more rewarding than conversation. Sometimes you need to be alone. For all of my busy life, you know, from Milan to New York to Paris to Mexico City to the giant cities of the world, I do seek solitude, but only for short periods of time, not long periods of time. But it is important for me to get away, think and ponder and 
wonder about my life and what's happening, what's going on, where to go from here. But some of the greatest rewards are in personal conversation. I've got some close friends, some mentors that have been around for the last 50 years for me. That a uh, couple of hours of conversation, you've got enough to feast on and live on for a while until you can have the next one. But it's easy to be a little too busy to go to lunch with a close friend and not miss it, or spend an evening with two or three families, enjoy life. You know, how much is a concert? Twenty-five dollars, thirty dollars, forty dollars. So he says, "Well, poor people can't afford to go to a concert." See, no, it's only eight Coca Colas. It just depends. So you save up your soft drink money and you do some special things. So lifestyle to live well doesn't cost a fortune. All it costs is paying attention. Then the little dramas. I told the story about calling my father after my mother died. My father lived another eight years. And he spent one more year out on the farm. Or which I still have up in Idaho, where I make a little wine and grow a few crops and live the good life overlooking the Snake River. But my father spent one more year the nights, and then he got a little lonely, and so I got him a place in this little farm village close by, so he could at least go there, spend the night, have breakfast, and then jump in his car and go back to the farm. And then there's a place close by called the Decoy Inn, little. Cafe where my father most every morning would have breakfast with the farmers. So I'd call him while he's having breakfast. Just takes ten minutes. Papa, I'm in Israel, and they'd bring him the phone, and he'd, we'd have this conversation, and he'd talk real loud so they could all hear the details. They gave me a reception last night on the rooftop. You see. Reception on the rooftop, underneath the stars. Papa says, underneath the stars. So everybody gets in on this little conversation he's having with me. Now he's got a story to tell for the rest of the day. My son called me from Israel. I know he had to get up in the middle of the night. Makes a much more special day. Only takes ten minutes. Easy to, easy not to. I'd send him these postcards from around the world, and he'd save them, show them around. When I'd get back, some of them had a little butter and jelly on them, right where he'd passed them around at breakfast. And then he'd get to retell the story. I was showing these postcards to. My friends, and here's what happened, and here's what they said, and it just it keeps this lively interchange between father and son going. I took him back where he was born in my motorhome one year, Odessa, Washington. Went to the newspaper office, and he went back into the vaults in this little community, and he found some newspapers dated 1903 when my father was born. So we went through them. No record of his birth. I said, you know, you were born out in the country, Papa. No record of your birth here. Like me, I was born at home. Then we went back to Wheeler, where he last went to school. When they had a place in town, they used to have a dry wheat farm, a couple of thousand acres in Moses Lake. But we went back to Wheeler, where he last went to school. He used to arrive early before the teachers got there and lit the fires in this old stove, you know, one or two room school, and、uh, it was gone. Tried to locate the place where they might have lived and couldn't find it. It's probably gone. The only thing left in Wheeler was a church and a bar. Bar. And my dad says, "Well, that's a pretty good combination. Get messed up in one place and get straightened out in the other." I said, "That's, that's good, Papa."
See, ladies and gentlemen, we get three to four thoughts a year that if we would act on those thoughts, they could change our life. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll remember that. No, write that thought down. I got a thought today I wrote down. A friend of mine is in the hospital. His morale is low. They're talking about amputating his foot. He's got to feel very bad. So I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm not only am I going to see him, but I can't be there with him all the time. I said, I'm going to create a tape for him that, that he can listen to that will heighten his level of morale. We told him the other night, don't go to surgery. You are depressed. Your energy level is down. No, no, tell him not now. Don't do it now. In fact, most doctors who have any sense of awareness don't perform surgery on patients that are in a state of fear. They don't think they will make it. They wait till they're in a different state of mind. So I said, what about making tapes for people that are facing physical challenges? I said, that's a good idea. All right. See, there are ideas that can come to you out of things that appear to be negative. I have a friend out of Chicago, just met him. He's 23 years old. And this guy, he went financially bankrupt two years ago, ruined his credit. Guess what he decided to do? He found a blessing in it. He wanted to restore his credit. It was very challenging, very difficult. And he realized that a lot of other people during these particular times have ruined their credit. So now he started a credit repair business. Last year, he earned over $100,000 helping people to restore their credit. I met a young lady who attends this church that she was at her father's funeral and, and she was putting flowers on her father's grave and she looked around and saw the other grave sites. They did not look well-groomed and they were not attended to on a regular basis. She started a grave site maintenance business. Out of that tragedy, something positive has come out of it. And now she's earning more money doing that than on her present job. What idea are you sitting on? Write your ideas down. And then, what idea are you sitting on? Write your ideas down. And then, once you get that idea, take the leap. Hello? Take the leap. See, a lot of people get the ideas and just walk around with them. Have you ever had an idea and all of a sudden you looked around and somebody had that idea and gone with it? <laughs> Think you're going to be going with my hospital idea. Forget that, buddy. We will be out there together, Jack. <laughs> take the leap. See, it's out here in the universe. If you don't take the plunge, I guarantee you, somebody else will. Take the plunge. Go into action. And ladies and gentlemen, you will be surprised at how things will come together. You'll be surprised now, you're gonna have some difficult challenges. I can tell you that now. Be aware of that. Things are not gonna work out exactly right. For a time they will, sometimes. And that's when life is just playing a game with you. I want you to feel good and relax. And then after a while, say, okay, the honeymoon's over now. And then life will come over there and slap you side to here. Say, what you doing out here? Well, this is my dream life, is that right? Come over here a minute. <laughs> oh, you went to the seminar, huh? Come here. <laughs> I can tell you that but ladies and gentlemen go into action with your dream and don't avoid where the fights are get in the midst of the fight and get some hickeys on your head get knocked down so you can learn how to fight so you can hold your position see most people don't get out in the arena of life because they don't want to fight most people don't get out there because they don't want to get knocked down. They don't want to be dropped to their knees. But see, you're going to be dropped whether you're on the field or whether or not you're sitting on the sidelines. You're going to be dropped. So at least get dropped for something. Don't get knocked down while you're sitting down. See, that's how most people are spectators in life. You don't want to be a spectator. You want to get out in the field where the action is. And you will be amazed. After the struggle, there will be a calm period and things will begin to click for you. Come out here with what you got. You don't have enough money, don't worry about it. You got the dream. You got the idea. You don't have enough resources, don't worry about it. You need some help, don't worry about it. You get out here in the arena, someone will look at you and become inspired and say, hey, can I help you? But if you're sitting up on the bleachers, nobody's going to ask you anything. You've got to get into the flow of action. Frances Hart called me from Chicago. She had been sitting on an idea of a show that she wanted to produce for 10 years called Mind Body Connection. 
So someone saw me speaking in Chicago at a sorority convention and said, I saw a guy that perhaps can host this show for you who has energy and charisma. She called me, she was so fired up. I said, listen, on the day that you want to do that, I'm speaking in Chicago. I can do it for you. And I said, by the way, I met somebody two weeks ago in Baltimore who has an idea of the same type of show and she's doing it on radio. Why don't you call her? And then she called me back. Who else would you suggest? I said, well, I know Deepak Chopra. He wrote the book called Quantum Healing and Bernie Siegel. Could you get his number? I tell you what, I have a friend named Jack Bolin at the Church of the Day. He knows how to get in touch with him. Call him and he will give you the number so you can get in touch with Bernie Siegel. That lady started calling all around, did not have the resources, but she had this idea and dream. And she said the other night when she came before the audience that had gathered in the studio, she said, I feel like I've been pregnant for 10 years. And this one was a little tough for me. He said, Mr. Owen, you've got pennies in your pocket. You've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling. You're behind on your promises. He says, here's how that occurs. You've attracted up until now, you've attracted the things to you because of the person you've become. Now I said, well, how can I change all that? He said, very simple. If you will change, everything will change for you. You don't have to change what's outside. All you've got to change is what's inside. To have more, you simply have to become more. And then he said, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. Start working on yourself, making these personal changes. And he said, it'll all change for you. Shelf said, here's the secret, Mr. Rohn. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I got that, it turned my life around. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy, I don't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late, I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on my cell. I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think it over. And start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity. If you'll start working harder on yourself than you do on your job. The thing that really, really helps is I've learned about the perspective to change my perspective. So for example, I show up to give and I always remind people that the, the most important thing about being an effective presenter, an effective speaker, is you have to show up with a giving attitude. You have to show up to give. You know something, you've seen something, you've done something, you've tried something that someone else thinks others need to hear. That's why they invited you to speak. The problem is the number of people who show up to take, to get. And you can see it, it's very plain to see. People ask a question and they say, you'll have to buy my book. Or you could just tell me the answer because you know the answer because you wrote the book, right? But clearly they're trying to drive book sales. It's a taking mentality. Every single slide of their PowerPoint has their Instagram, their email, their website, their Facebook. Well, clearly they want you to follow them. They want you to reach out. The last slide is their website and their email, right? They have a taking mentality. They come up and the first thing they do is tell you their credentials. Hi, my name is, you know, Dr. Blah, Blah. I have six PhDs. I've worked for 55 companies. I advise CEOs and generals. And let me tell you a little something. It's about them. It's very easy and very quick to discern who's the giver and who's the taker. The best speakers, 100% of them, you look at all the top TED folks, you know, Sir Ken Robinson, Amy Cuddy, Brene Brown, right? Dan Pink, all of them. All of them are there to give. 